This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix, into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasenor formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more just head over to LMNT to find out or better still go down to the show notes click on the link the sleep for performance link to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well you don't even need to send it back so check it out at LMNT in the show notes welcome back to the sleep for performance podcast today I am joined by Mr. James Hewitt soon to be Dr. James Hewitt so you will uh, have a name change coming up. James, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks, Ian. James, where do you join us today? Where are you best? So I'm based in Cambridge now, uh, in okay. the UK. Actually, we were living in the French Alps for about six and a half years until oh, last that year. Must have been, that must have been very, um, very hard. That must have been tough, difficult. Yeah. I feel for you. Tough gig. Um, I, but it was, it was time to move back for a variety of different reasons. Um, and uh, my wife's family is from this, this area. But um, funny enough, actually, we've uh, had some uh, a meaningful amount of snow. I might describe it here in Cambridge oh, really? this morning. It's quite unusual, so we're feeling very, very much at home. Good excuse to pull out the snow boots and already got the winter tires on the car. So uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's great. We feel uh, feel like we've been transported. I wonder what the bets are at William Hill now for a white Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not odds not as good as they were, I imagine. Have you ever seen a white Christmas in the UK? Um, not since I was a kid. I think there was one when I was very young, but um, they're pretty rare, particularly here in the in the south of the country. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, we'll see. Whereabouts are you based in? I didn't ask uh, you that. Yeah, so I'm actually based in Perth in Western Australia, as you can tell from uh, the accent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I'm from uh, the middle of Ireland originally, um, and I've been here for about 20 years. Great. So yeah. You kept the I'm, accent, uh, which is good to hear. Yeah, I... I actually, I, do you have any um, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Because there seems to be a kind of an age where once you pass by like a, a threshold where people just keep their accents. So I've got two friends who are Scottish. One came here when he was about 13, sounds Australian. Another guy came here when he was 16, full blown like Glaswegian accent. Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, think, yeah. I mean, I'm, it's not my area of expertise, but. There's definitely something about the acquisition of an accent and pronunciation yeah. that seems that I've heard some people say that um, unless you acquire a language as a child, it's very difficult to um, fully be able to replicate the accent in another language. Mm. Um, and um, obviously, there's always exceptions to the rule. But there's something about that kind of acquiring a language or learning a language at a very young age. But I do think that some people just seem to have this um, ability to uh, naturally fall into kind of mimicking or adopting other accents. So, yeah. you know, I've got friends where wherever we go in the world, they always seem to start to mirror the accent, even if they don't mm. speak the language. And they yeah. just, uh, I don't know whether it's some kind of, yeah, there's some kind of social effect there, but um, but yeah, there's definitely a difference. Some people just switch into it. I think age is, an effect, age is a factor, whereas some people just stay true to their roots forever, which yeah, has got I, the same, same benefits yeah, as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's another interesting one as well. So I don't know where I was talking about this recently, but it was about um, how lots of, oh, this what it was, what it was about. I went into a shop a couple of weeks ago and one of the ladies working in the shop was Cro, no, Macedonian and the other lady was Spanish. Mm. And they both thought I was American. 
And yeah. I was like, that's, really? That's interesting. Yeah. And I was like, this is fascinating. And Lou was like, oh, I didn't really know her, maybe American or Canadian. And the last time I was back in Ireland a few years ago, people asked me if I was Canadian in my own hometown. Really? And I was like, oh, but that's think, really bizarre. Yeah. So I think it's like a softening that way. However, not many Irish people can pick up a full Australian accent, but a lot of Irish people can pick up an American accent very quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? And then, of course, you know, in England, where I'm from, you can walk 15 minutes down the road and people have got yeah. a very different accent. It's uh, which I think you find in other countries as well, but yeah, not what no, well. So this morning I was meeting with uh, one of my PhD students who's from Switzerland, and then another guy who just finished his PhD who's from Australia, and the Swiss guy was saying the same as me. And what you're saying, and the and in Australia, you can go thousands of kilometers and people still sound the same. A bit more homogenous. Yeah, whereas in Ireland, like 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 probably in the UK, you can go five ten miles down the road and it's completely. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's inaudible. <laughs> what do you say? Anyway, anyway, your listeners are probably wondering why we're talking about accents so much. Because I That's actually okay. know nothing about it, except I, for I, my own kind of anecdotal experience. Don't worry about it, James. Nobody listens to this. <laughs> 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 I actually was going to call this uh, podcast Tangents originally, because I just go on tangents the whole time. So, yeah. Right. So yeah, don't worry about that. We, we go off on wonderful tangents. That's, that's the good thing. So anyway, you're joining us from Cambridge today. And, um, exactly. For people who are kind of wondering, this is the first time I met James. I came across James on LinkedIn, and I'd urge you to go over to LinkedIn if you're in the business community and follow James Hewitt. Um, he's got some really interesting stuff here on LinkedIn, and, and this is really why I invited James on the podcast today. James has been posting um, you know, really good content on his newsfeed and LinkedIn, really easy um, you know, um, like one of the most recent ones here, like are you a snoozer or a non-snoozer? And so you take these great like studies and you try to apply them down into sort of simplest, simple language, get them across in your posts, little kind of takeaways, um, you know, a little kind of infographs as well. And I think it's really, it's it's really good, you know, what you're what you're doing here. You're, you know, like I said to you before the podcast started, you're crossing over into um this sort of really nice area of science communication. And it's really good because I think Again, many academics, as I said, will write papers within academia inside their own echo chamber just for the sake of it. But what you're doing here is trying to jump the fence and really do that. So I suppose the first question is, James, why are you doing this? Yeah, so, I mean, it was a, an interesting journey to end up where I was. Um, and and I still span these academic and, and business worlds, um, I'd describe it as. Um, but the, um, the entry point into this journey for me actually um, started when I was a full-time racing cyclist. So um, back in the early 2000s, um, I was trying to become a professional cyclist, professional road oh. cyclist. So um, back then, there weren't the same Olympic development pathways that there are now uh, in Britain. So I um, did what many people before me had done, which is to move to France and race for a French team. And uh, so I started um, uh, in the early 2000s, around 2002, moved to France to race for a, a regional French team and then stayed and just gradually started to improve and ended up. Uh, racing for a professional development team so it was I was an under 23 rider um, racing for um, a development team for a team called, that was called Brioche de Boulanger um, and um, with the hope that if I was good enough in that development team I'd get a full professional ride um, and I did that full time for several years um, but I was acutely aware that I wasn't the most talented rider and so it was clear that you know I, I had to think very carefully about my diet and my nutrition and my training to try and maximize my potential whereas some of my peers didn't seem to care at all and could still beat me which was very frustrating but <laughs> I really enjoyed the process of optimization and trying to understand what was working best for me and one of the ways that I did that was to be a very early adopter of technologies so back then in the early 2000s not many people in France in particular were using power meters, which is a, a measurement system to actually quantify the mechanical work that you do on the bike, but also the mechanical work that might be required um, to achieve a particular objective in a race, for example. And so I adopted these technologies very early, started to build my own spreadsheets to understand what types of training and what approaches were working best for me. And other people started to notice this, and many people were very skeptical, but some were quite interested. And without really realizing it fell into coaching people because um, I was sharing that knowledge. Um, but by the time I got to the end of my time as an under 23, 
um, I made the pragmatic decision to to retire in inverted commas uh, <laughs> because it was clear that I wasn't going to have a great professional career. So yeah. I went back to university. I studied sports science, eventually went into the bike industry, but as a coach primarily uh, and as a sports scientist and worked with a variety of different riders uh, in different contexts. But uh, in my own coaching practice, ended up finding a niche working with people who had very demanding professional careers you know, as finance professionals or architects or uh, management consultants in London, where I was based at the time, who also wanted to pursue these very challenging cycling events. And in trying to quantify their training and what was working best for them, I realized that unless I could account for the load associated with what was going on in their working life, I couldn't plan their training effectively. Mm. So I started to try to initially apply tools and frameworks from organizational psychology to understand what was going on in their working life, but realized that at the time, the organizational psychology literature uh, was quite limited, uh, primarily to cross-sectional research with a heavy reliance on survey measures. And survey measures are obviously useful. It provides a good insight into the experience of the person. Um, but um, I felt it was lim limited primarily because it was often at a single time point. So you go into an organization, measure thousands of people but on one day. But for me as a sports scientist, you know, I'd never take that approach when I was coaching an athlete um, or even a group of athletes. Mm. It was all about longitudinal measures, often multimodal measures, yeah. uh, where you might look at someone's rating of perceived exertion, their kind of power output, trends over time, training load in particular blocks. Um, and so I started to wonder, could I develop a similar method to understand the working uh, to understand working life in the workplace and came across this framework called digital phenotyping that's used quite extensively in clinical research um, where they combine psychological physiological and behavioral measures to uh, quantify the observable characteristics of a person um, and realize that could be applied quite well in an organizational setting too um, but um, as I was just trying to cobble together these approaches it realized there was a gap in the literature and that inspired me to go back and do my phd um, but um, the way that i conceptualized what was going on in the workplace was that we could look at knowledge work which is work where you think for a living as a cognitive endurance activity in a similar way as you might think about cycling as a physical endurance activity so um, my phd looks at um, combining different measures this digital phenotyping approach uh, to understand the relationship between well-being and performance in the workplace, particularly cognitive performance. Um, but uh, looking at it in the context of what I describe as always on working patterns, because the thing that I found that most of the people that I worked with struggled with, these people that had very de demanding jobs and also tried to be good amateur athletes, um, was that they were very good at switching on when they needed to, but quite poor at switching off when they wanted to. And mm -hmm. by switching off, I mean experiencing psychological detachment so that mental distance from work but also recovering and I also saw a general principle in working with athletes and business people which is that um in I would argue this is perhaps controversial that uh, we can't overtrain but we can under recover uh -huh. and in one sense Let's you can't stop. overwork but you can under recover Let's and so yeah that's that's kind of how I ended up let, let's let's let, let, let's jump off there, right? I'm gonna reverse back because you've given us a really brief, good overview of everything. So I want to pull pull push back and uh, not push back, but pull back a little bit and go into some things because um, you may I I don't know if you've heard any of these episodes of this podcast, and um, probably not because nobody listens. Um, on sleep for performance, we've had a guy on before called Brendan Brandon Marcello, mm -hmm. and have you ever heard of Brandon Marcello? Yeah, I've come across his. I've come across him before. Yeah, so Brandon, um, so Brandon set on a scientific advisory board for another business, but um, Brandon on uh, season six, episode six, Brandon's PhD was in exactly that topic. Mm -hmm. And so it's exactly what you said, James, is that there's no such thing as overtraining, there's just under recovering. Yeah. And so you simply, you know, you basically can't overtrain, you just don't have that time to recover. So it's interesting because I think this is the problem that people have is in this area, whether you be an amateur athlete working or whether you be a full-time athlete or just doing a bit of exercise, there's a complete imbalance in people's approaches to this um, and and sort of a realistic expectation about what you can train, what you can recover and what you can do, and not just um, what you're saying about all these kind of layers in the cake that's on top of it. But then it's like, where are you on that conveyor belt of the cake? I would say, are you a very young cake, a middle-aged cake or an older cake? 
and all these yep, other exactly. factors as well that have to be on it as well. And I think this is really uh this is really interesting. Um and so yeah, but let's let's um let's jump back um because I want to talk about um when you did sports science. Um what what mm-hmm. ma- why did you want to go back and do sports science after being a cyclist? What what sort of a what was in it? What was the attraction for you? Why not go and do something like maybe engineering, where it'd be more about the dynamics of the bike, like aer- aeronautical stuff or aerospace engineering, or getting more into data analytics? Why sports science specifically? Well, I've always just been fascinated with human potential, and that's been a fascination ever since I was a child. So um, we, um, I actually spent a few years when I was a very, a very young, uh, uh, living in North America with my my dad's job. And um, and so we uh, we lived in the deep south, actually, um, but um, uh, we did some trips out from there and over to Houston in particular in Texas and saw the NASA kind of facility there. And um, and um, and so I was exposed to this was in the 80s. Um, and so um, you know, during the time where people still used to watch shuttle launches in, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> in the States, it was still exciting. Yeah. Um, and um, and so I remember as a very young kid kind of seeing on TV shuttle launches and uh, and going to NASA um, in, in Houston and um, learning about astronauts. And, and I just thought it was just the most amazing thing that you know, humans could go to space mm-hmm. and started to, even at a very young age, want to understand how does a human get ready to go to space? And what are the challenges that they experience in this environment in space? And, uh, and so it really was the genesis of this fascination mm-hmm. with, with human physiology, um, I wouldn't have described it as psychology at the time, but it was psychology. It was people's experience of you know, overcoming fear, um, training, being able to uh, perform at their best, even in very challenging circumstances. And, you know, as a three year old, certainly that's not the language that I would use. But um, but that curiosity about human potential and um, and how people can uh, achieve really fantastic things yeah. uh, if they're in the right environment, with the right training, with the right, the right people around them um, fascinated me. And so that continued. And then. You know, I was uh, quite academic at school, um, but always did other sports as well. And so um, I've always been fascinated with sports with wheels. And so actually, um, at quite a young age, uh, I got involved with a very obscure sport called inline speed skating. And um, you know, this was because you know I was just like going around on inline skates at this local rink, and some random dude said, "Why don't you try speed skating?" And it turned out he was the coach of this club, which was a very good club and um uh, and got involved with that and ended up representing great britain in line speed skating as a junior racing all over europe uh, and did okay at that um, uh, before i actually transitioned went into into road cycling so i've always been very interested in human performance and human potential uh, in sport because i think that sport is a great laboratory for human performance because i've always been interested in quantification i've always wanted to measure things and the thing i liked about sport was that you could you could measure human potential in a more objective way mm. and so um so for me um you know, sports science was a very natural uh, way to um for me to continue exploring the things that i was really curious about mm. um so understanding the systems and approaches that could help people to realize more of their potential and that that really is my core purpose that's my driver in yeah, life yeah. is to explore and help people to uh, realize more of their potential so yeah sports science was quite a logical it felt for me a uh, topic to go and explore at degree level but then as i mentioned that's transition now really into um the domain is really organizational psychology for my phd but approaching it as a sports scientist essentially mm. approaching knowledge work as a cognitive endurance activity yeah yeah so um i i see then like uh, from linkedin you did transition out of um like you said from coaching and cycling that sort of world performance scientist with cycle for um, uk and then you sort of jumped across into you worked for hinta for a while yeah that's right now is that yeah, the same so, hints of performance that works with the f1 drivers exactly yeah so um so that was mm. so i worked with hints for just over five years um, yeah. and um, and so that came about because i had my own coaching business in london as i mentioned and um and i was really um uh, working hard to try and create a system that could translate some of these learnings in a sporting context over into a business context as well so you know sometimes i describe there's, there's kind of three general principles which i think uh, apply very well to both sport and business which is one that you can achieve better results with similar effort if you apply effort in the right place at the right time yeah the second is that we need to plan and be disciplined to recover even if we don't feel like it and the third is the importance of finding and following our own rhythms so really understanding you know in a a business context things like chronotype for example Mm. uh, when we might be at our best 
Um, but I was thinking about this, this, these learnings from sport to business. So I was working with some um, kind of uh, very, uh, some people in some very demanding jobs, but also quite high profile jobs. And uh, along the way was introduced to uh, Dr. Aki Hintzer, who founded Hintzer Performance, who was a very well-known sports doctor, initially working with McLaren and the drivers there, but then many um, Formula One world champions uh, and, and other drivers and teams. And um, I was invited to go over to Geneva to have a discussion with him and just share some thoughts because he'd heard about what I was doing. And he was also in the process of scaling up Hintzer from what was a very small um, coaching company, a boutique coaching company, mainly working with athletes, but also some uh, business people and, and wanted to grow a larger corporate well-being business. Yeah. And so Aki invited me over. We had a great conversation. I also met uh, someone that was he was working with who was building this business. And following that meeting, um, they approached me and said, James, would you like to join us uh, on this, this mission to try and grow what we're doing? And uh, they felt that I had something that I could contribute meaningfully to that. And it felt like a, just a great opportunity. So I um, uh, 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 moved my family at the time. We had a six month, uh, we had a um, kind of a three and a half year old and a six month old. My wife and I moved to the French Alps and I was based out of Geneva and, um, and uh, worked with that company where we, we grew it from, I don't know, um, I'm sure my colleagues who were there will correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, somewhere in the region of probably 17 people uh, in terms of who were mostly coaches when I joined up to a, an organization that was over 100 people. Um, and uh, really, I was working at that intersection of science and practice. Mm -hmm. you know, initially, as a science and development director, in the end, uh, I was responsible more for innovation, uh, research and innovation and uh, applying new techniques and methods uh, to help our clients. But that was just a, an amazing experience working again with business people and sports people. Um, so um, I um, got the opportunity to work with some uh, really interesting people in uh, in a, a motorsport context as well in, in Formula One. Um, some of the drivers directly, a lot of the time I was working kind of alongside the, the performance coaches and um, uh, helping them to be aware of emerging research, for example, that might be helpful to them uh, and vetting different approaches. Um, because obviously a lot of people always were sending us things that we could uh, potentially use uh, in, in the yeah. context of Formula One and some were great and some not so great um, but that was a really yeah it was yeah. a really um, formative and um, pivotal time in my career the years that I spent there. Uh, with so I, I think we might have a lot of overlap here Jim so I don't know if you know we've been working with McLaren for the last two years. Mm. Yeah so I saw been, that on you. Yeah so we've been working with um, with the guys through Salus Optimum and McLaren Technologies for the last two years doing some stuff around travel and jet lag and building out an app mm. for them. Well, they've been building out the app. We've been building out the content. And then previous uh, uh, works with Daniel Ricardo, who's from here in mm. Perth when he was at Reynolds. But um, you may have come across a mutual contact as well, Tom Clark. Yeah. 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 So I know Tom pretty well. Yeah. 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 So, so I, when, he, when he joined yeah. Hintz, uh, um, uh, kind of quite a few years ago now, but he's a great guy. Yeah. I, I think, think he's been racing together actually uh, and hung out. He's with Est Esteban Pocon now mm -hmm. at Alpine. Yeah. Yeah, he's there, yeah. So, yeah, I was talking to Tom a little bit before the pandemic. We are talking about doing some stuff together and sharing some info. But, um, yeah, so our world's probably cross over there in, in terms of yeah, F1. Definitely. So, yeah, it's a very it's interesting It's a very small area. world. It's yeah, it's, it's, a bit too, it's a bit too small, yeah. And it's interesting what you said because a lot of people do kind of say to you, oh, you should tell them we can do this and I can do that. And I'm like, uh, this isn't like, you know, one person gets a foot in the door and prize it open for everybody else. And um, it's a very different industry compared yeah. to other 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 um you know we'll say um you know mining oil and gas or anything like that and it's very different than other sports as well it's not like a rugby team or an afl team or a cricket team it's uh formula one is a it's a different beast <laughs> yeah it's kind of fun it's kind of a weird yeah. world and um, i think it's you know it's a bit uh some people say you know it's uh it's too much of a business to be a sport and too much of a sport to be a business um, yeah. <laughs> so you've got that that aspect of it, um, yeah. but also it's kind of like a, a traveling circus as well. So that's what I call it. Traveling like, circus, kind of yeah. Dipped in and dipped in, dipped out of races. Um, you yeah. never followed the whole thing, um, but um, spent a lot, quite a lot of time with you know the coaches who were part of it in the paddock and you know, speaking with them, and always was very fascinated to hear their experience because obviously they travel on the whole thing mm. all year round, and um, you know all the politics and all of the relationships. I mean. It's there's no it was no surprise to me when um, I saw that Drive to Survive was was so popular, the Netflix series, because it is a soap opera. And, yeah. um, and you know, obviously that series only shows that the half of it. But um, it's uh, it's a really fascinating world and quite an addictive world to be part of. You know, I um, uh, you know, it, it's a, it, I think 
it's a, the people who are in it all the time you know they will often articulate that or at least they have in the conversations that i've had with them that um in some ways it can be quite destructive because you are always away from home and it can be quite mm -hmm. challenging for uh, uh, relationships but at the same time it's such a stimulating environment and there's so much variety and um you know not just in terms of the places that you travel to but the people that you meet and the challenges you have to overcome and so it's this kind of a hyper stimulating environment yeah. and uh, which I think a lot of people that I've spoken to in it have this love hate relationship with the with the sport. Mm. Um, and um, uh, but uh, but yeah, I'm sure you've probably encountered some similar similar yeah. stories in the world yeah, you've done as well. I imagine. It's 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 pretty interesting world. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Yeah. And um, yeah, I sort of became a fan as well sort of from the drive to survive and then working with Daniel originally. But um yeah it, it never ceases to surprise me every year and just watching driver moves and who can bring in money and who can bring in sponsorship and is it really about equity and fairness and the best driver is it more about your worth and your stock and who you know and who you don't know and you can see like how rich people just stay in the sport or rich people's kids you know get into it like um you know mr stroll and the rest of them it's like well daddy bought the team so that he gives me a c you know and you know and then if they're trying to break into emerging markets like well, we'll get a driver like from China or we'll get a driver from Japan or it's just really interesting to watch it. It's it's not like any other sport. And it's and it's Ooh. got so much money in that that it's kind of um it's kind of like it's it's like posturing the world. Well, what are you gonna do about it? Like it's like you're not gonna cancel, no one's gonna cancel you. It's just it's really Ooh. interesting in today's world how they just sort of I don't know, they're so brash about it and go, oh well, you're out, he's in, he brings in money, and no one cares. And it's brutal. And I think, I mean, yeah. you do see that in, in many high performance environments that, you know, that there is, um, uh, uh, it, it, there can be brutal environments because mm. there's big pressures and big powers at play. Um, and, you know, the, the human, the individual sometimes uh, uh, kind of gets lost in that. Um, but, um, but again, I think where you've got these big power dynamics at play, that's another thing that makes it really fascinating to observe and, and be a part of. Um, but um, but yeah, um, I think uh, uh, sometimes there's a there, there can be a bit of a dark side to that as well. Yeah, massive egos. <laughs> James, you've got these uh, two websites up here. You've got a uh, James Hewitt Performance .com and you've got your uh, Sustainable Performance Academy as well. Um, sort of on the James you know, Hewitt Performance, this is kind of a lot of stuff you put off on the LinkedIn with the blogs and so on. Um, you know, and you've got these modules here, which we'll talk about in a minute on the sustainable performance. But you know, a lot of things you put up here are, are quite are quite good in terms of like what people will need. Um, and I, I expect what, what resonates with me, I think, when I look at your stuff, is that it's very much aimed towards, and I would say the the middle of the road. I'm going to say the middle class person that has the middle class job, his middle class family, is trying to work, is trying to exercise, trying to do an MBA in the evening. You're trying to you're trying to target that market. Of, it's what I get the feeling from. You know, work harder, not work smarter, not harder. Manage stress, improve sleep and recovery, increase energy, enhance cognitive performance. It's probably every person in their forties dream. Oh, I wish I could do all of those at once. Is is that? Am I getting that sense right? If that's what you're aiming at. Yeah, yeah, and I'm pleased that comes through. Um, that uh, it's encouraging to hear that I probably you've, that I've managed to translate my idea of a target market into some copy on a website. Um, but um, but yeah, and it, and it is that is the target market. And again, because they were the people that I was working with initially as a, as a cycling coach a long time ago now, um, and then continue to work with now. And um, and actually, the the subjects, the participants of my PhD research were that that population. Um, and because there's a lot of people in that group, and I think a lot of people you know are are doing okay. But we do know that they are the challenges. I think for many people mm. who uh, can fall into that middle that you describe who are struggling with stress, who perhaps would like to sleep a bit better than they are, who sometimes struggle with brain fog, you know, that feeling that they can't really concentrate or focus as much as they'd like to. Uh, they're distracted at work and there's lots of competing priorities at home as well. And trying to translate um, some of the scientific evidence base that's emerging, um, uh, which is relevant to that population, to help people to uh, build this foundation of well-being and support their performance too. Um, but um, but the PhD research was really uh, driven by observing some of these challenges, this always on way of working, mm. and then um, wanted to try and gather some data to find out which levers we can pull to have the greatest positive impact for for these people. Um, and um, and then you know, the, the website uh, is a blog where obviously people can, can find articles um, which translate some of that science hopefully into practical tools that people can apply in their in their day to day life. 
And then obviously people can click out and go to your Sustainable Performance Academy as well, where they can actually do lessons and follow a plan on this um, over um, a seven week program where it covers many of these topics, where it gets broken down from you know behavior change and sleep, increase your energy, nutrition and so on. So obviously, then that's a kind of a plan that people can kind of self be self paced through that. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So the idea of that is a, it's a micro learning approach. So it's a course that's broken down to very short videos uh, and text content, which you can do in about five minutes a day. And so some people decide to kind of blast it and do it in seven weeks. Other people will space it and maybe do one theme a month. Um, but um, but it's these. It's the idea is that it's inspirational content um, that then involves it creates some really practical actions that you can apply. Um, and uh, and you can get that um, uh, through the website, as you said, but but actually the, the primary market for that so far has actually been um, businesses who want to license the content and deliver it as part of their yep. corporate wellbeing programs. Because, um, you know, we see that there's a lot of businesses who recognize also that um, these are big challenges for people in their teams. And um, uh, and so this idea of creating uh, content which is really scalable, which they can share um, to increase awareness of not just the challenges, but what you can do about it um, uh, as part of a, a broader program to address some of these challenges and maybe even tackle some of the root causes has been really effective. And so when I've worked with organizations to implement this, we've often also included a, a physiological measurement component as well as a behavioral measurement component using a combination of wearables and surveys. So um, in addition to sharing content, we can actually measure some of the effects of the interventions that are recommended in it. And that's something people can do individually as well if they want to check it out. Um, but for example, you know, I talk about um, you know, breathing exercises for stress management. It's just one yeah. of the little ideas in there. And so if you track that um, with um, kind of a measure of your experience of stress, but also some physiological indicator like uh, maybe sleep or HRV, uh, when we've done that in an organizational context, we've seen some really um, measurable uh, positive impacts so with breathing exercises for example uh, with one organization saw some statistically significant decreases in people's experience of negative stress associated mm. with them, uh, them them trying these those very simple breathing exercises uh, at a population level which um which was really uh, really kind of gratifying to see uh, that that science being translated into a tool that really improved people's lives because yeah. we know that stress negative stress is something that's a huge issue for many of us in that middle uh, group that you described, you know, the kind yeah. of 30, 40 something professional trying to juggle many competing priorities. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's often a group that I find as well as most interested in sleep. And when I go around to different companies or, you know, give talks or whatever, it's the same kind of thing. And I, and I often say to people like, you can't have it all. And I think there's part of it is, you know, one great thing about the internet is, and you're probably like me, James, where you remember the time when there was no internet and, you know, you had your, um, your internet was basically like your encyclopedias in the house and you went and looked up mm -hmm. something and that was it, right? But now you're kind of bombarded with social media, uh, particularly like, you know, Instagram, YouTube, listening to podcasts. And I get people coming to me in their 40s going, oh, but I heard on Joe Rogan and I read this and David Goggins this and Jocko this and blah, 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 this. So I'm like, wait now, let's just have a think about it. It's 24 hours in a day. You want to get eight hours sleep. You got to, you're working probably eight to 10 hours when you're factoring commute time. That's a minimum. You want to do a martial art, run an ultra marathon, um, stretch, do breath work, go to hot yoga, uh, do an MBA. You got two kids as well. And you need to do the garden and whatever other jobs you want to do and catch up with people and live a fruitful life. It's like, fuck, man. You want, you need to go to Mars or some other planet where there's 42 hours in a day. Like, you, you yeah. just can't do it. And there's this unrealistic expectation. I think sometimes mm -hmm. it's just about exactly. resetting expectations for people and saying, listen, what's really important? And putting these habits and behaviors in, into their life and just looking at, and sometimes I do this on the board, I write, I write always a mathematical problem. And I go, it was 24 hours and all the things you want to do are 38 hours. So how's that mm -hmm. going to work, lads? And people start laughing. Or the other one yeah. I use as well is like, you know, people talk about, oh, I can't fall asleep. And I go, do you have kids? Yeah. What do you do before the kids go to sleep? Oh, have a bath, tell them they're going to bed soon, turn down the lights, read them a story, um, and then I go to sleep. And then I said, how do you go to sleep? Oh, well, I get some emails done, and then uh, check my phone, and I jump into bed. I'm like, so why are you doing that for the kid and not for yourself? Mm, you know, and it's just that's a great point. It's resetting these things, like these kind of um, these behaviors where people can, mm. like you said, get the rest, get the recovery. 
And I often say to people as well, like, just treat yourself with a bit of kindness, you know? And we're all as bad. I'm as bad as anybody else. Like, don't get me wrong. I do too many things. I have years of running ultra marathons and doing ultra swimming and I do martial arts still and work out and probably do still do way too much. But it's like, you just sometimes you just have to go, right, I can have a day off. It's okay. It's yeah. okay just to take a breath like you're saying because I think we're... 95% on the strength and conditioning and the training, the go, the go, the go. And the recovery just seems to be like about the last five or 10%. And again, mm-hmm. I'm probably the worst offender. But we don't sit there, meditate, do breath work, calm the system down. And I think it's really nice that you're talking about that for this population mm-hmm. about getting that balance right back into your life. Because if not, we'll just blow a gasket and die. <laughs> yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And I think, and you know, and that is an extreme outcome, but it, and so it does happen. And, you know, I, I think one of the things I find interesting uh, in you know, working with very high performers and most of the companies I work with are, I describe them as very high performing companies, multinationals in some of these sectors that I've described um, is you know, people, particularly in quite senior positions um, have got an incredible capacity often to absorb stress and challenge. And um, often what will happen, I've observed, is that they continue to perform externally very, very well. But what ends up happening is that you can kind of track their well-being performance. It's a J-shaped curve um, where, yeah. unfortunately, you know, rather than just this gradual drop off, um, it's a catastrophic decline uh, where you know people end up going on sabbatical, i.e. burnout. Um, uh, but um, and 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 so I think that often one of the things I end up talking a lot about is this stress and recovery and sleep and again that switching off component and some people resist this idea that you know, oh, you know it's not switching off it's just kind of uh, diverting your attention onto something else not work related and i get that but this idea of psychological detachment getting a sense of mental distance then maybe reattaching to something else not work related or or being able to slow down physiologically we'll talk about you know trying to um, improve that balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system consistently with people in this group who are very conscientious often uh, in terms of their personality traits. Um, uh, there's often some perfectionism in there as well. Um, they don't have any difficulty switching on and training hard, pushing hard. And we see, I see often in terms of the type of physical training that they do, they're often overloading on high intensity mm-hmm. work. You know, they bought a Peloton bike during lockdown and they're kind of smashing themselves on that. And um, it's actually the switching off, it's the slowing down that's most difficult. And unfortunately, uh, I think that we do hear there's a lot of voices out there um, that are just kind of loading more tasks and responsibilities under the umbrella of well-being onto a life that's already saturated. And so, you know, now we're supposed to be doing ice baths every morning and you know, fasting uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, following some kind of protocol where we're avoiding eating. And unfortunately, this is all just added stress. And, you know, we know from the allostatic load models that in some ways our organism as a kind of human doesn't differentiate between these physiological and psychological stress buckets. It kind of just goes in to the allostatic load uh, and, and starts to overload. And then we see a breakdown and likely in you know, many of the, the kind of issues that we see in modern working life in terms of health, whether that's mental or physical, you know, there's a driver in this population from being overloaded with, with stress. So I think sometimes people, uh, there's, a, there's a risk when we're in this kind of well-being. we talk about performance uh, in this space, that um, uh, we can end up just trying to add more tasks. And often, I think when I'm working with individuals or companies, it's often actually about stripping back. And as you said, mm-hmm. kind of being really clear about what you can do and what you can fit. And there's a great quote that I often use from a guy called Brad Stolberg, who's an author in this space. Uh, he's written some great books. And he often says, uh, um, try to be, uh, rather than consistently great, be great at being consistent yeah and actually that's really good I like strip that. back and actually look at what can you do consistently because you know we all see the linkedin posts of the person who's you know, woken up at 5 a.m done a nice bath meditated for half an hour uh, you know been for a run then you know drunk their ashwagandha tea you know done four hours of deep work blah 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 blah, blah. now perhaps they do that every day if they do i can almost guarantee they're unlikely to have a life partner or kind of children or anyone really reliant on them. Um, and um, But more often than not, many of these people, if you actually dig under the surface, they don't do that every day. They did one day and created a LinkedIn post because yeah. they're going to get some views out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, or they did it just because they know that it's slightly controversial and they're going to get a load of engagement uh, from yeah. saying something like that. But meanwhile, kind of, I've worked with a lot of people who you know, just feel like they're not doing enough. And, oh, well, if only I added the ice bath in, then you know, everything would be yeah, fine. Yeah. And actually, I might just 
just relax. And I think you really hit the nail on the head, Ian, where you said often we need to learn or relearn to be kind and kinder yeah. to ourselves and actually say it's okay. You know, uh, I mean, there's this growing uh, prevalence, it seems, and I'd be interested to hear your view of this, uh, of uh, kind of um, orthosomnia and people who are um, obsessed with their sleep. And there were some yeah. really interesting case studies published a few years ago uh, of people uh, where they were describing people who, even though um, trained sleep scientists following sleep studies were telling them that their sleep was fine, they uh, would not believe them because their Fitbit or wearable device was telling them that they were sleeping poorly. And there's this growing obsession yeah. with sleep that's actually having a really negative effect. So this is a I like using wearables in my own research. Yeah. Sometimes we've got to ditch it because it's causing more stress. This this so, is yeah. a fascinating I'm topic. So, so last week, um, I don't know if you've come across a guy called Matt Driller. He's an associate professor at Latrobe. And Matt has this, know. Matt started this group called Siesta. He's a reverse engineer mm. and nice. Siesta, it's sleep in exercise and sports, um, technical analytics or trend analytics, right? So it's trying to bring... He's yeah, really so he's, got it in there. Isn't he? He's really shoehorned a reverse engineer to back in. So we had a bit of a get together last week in Latrobe in Melbourne, which is approximately a four hour flight from here in Perth. Um, um, and anyway, we, we, we spoke about this and Matt and I have published some papers together, but uh, we recently have a paper in myself, Matt, uh, Carrie Lambin and Amy Bender, um, talking about uh, pajamas and polysomnography type of thing, right? For sports, right? So mm. we've done a narrative review and a book chapter, but it's we do talk exactly about this, James, about people's obsession with the metrics, and and it's been coming up lately as well. And I think what's happening is, um, and this ties into some of the work we did with McLaren because in this app we built in the ability to read in wearables and any kind of what's the trigger points for good and bad. Mm. A couple of things on this I often say to people is um, number one, if you're wearing a wearable device. First of all, let's look at it in terms of what it can do and can't do. It's an activity tracker. It's not a medical diagnostic device, right? So let's get that out of the way first. It's a tracker. Secondly, these things are marketed very well. Doesn't mean they can do them perfectly. Marketing and science are two different things. They're approved as activity trackers. And then I'll say is these devices for things like time at sleep onset, time you wake up, maybe the amount of times you wake up overnight are pretty good, but for sleep stages, they're very bad. And all the papers mm-hmm. show that. So don't really get obsessed with the metrics. And for a couple of reasons, the metrics on like the REM sleep and so on, because for a couple of reasons, one is you can't do anything about it. If you wake up in the morning, you got 12% REM. What's your action that night? You can't go to bed going, get REM, get REM, get REM, get REM, get REM. Like you can't do some sort of mantra to do it, right? So there's mm-hmm. nothing you can do. The second thing is, when you look at the data, like time at sleep onset and time awake, don't look at it night to night. Look at it on average. Look at it over a 14-day window or a 21-day window and look at your sleep patterns and behaviors, which goes to your point about consistency. And it's mm. not that you want to be going to bed every night at like 9 or 2, but am I going to bed in a tolerable range between 9 and 10? Am I getting up between 6 and 7? Because we're not robots. We There's days we're going to stay up late. We want to watch an extra show. We want to we're having a chat with a friend. And those things might be just as good. But I think you're right. I think people are absolutely obsessed with these devices. And I think it's actually getting to a point where I wonder, and I spoke to Michael Gradner about this as well in the US. I wonder sometimes are they doing more good than bad, uh, more bad than good, like you said, because mm. people flip out. People have full on panic attacks. Like I had somebody in a talk three weeks ago go, um, Excuse me, excuse me. My watch has been consistently shown now that I don't get enough REM sleep. And they say it in, in Matthew Walker's book, why don't we why do we sleep? If you don't get REM, you'll die. Am I gonna die? And I go, uh, yeah, you got about two weeks. Like, and they're like, what? I'm like, relax. You're not gonna die. Like, chill out. You're yeah, it's probably uh, wrong. Yeah, you're probably you're taking measure that's crap and then inferring more mm. crap from it. And it's really interesting to watch people spin out of control with this stuff. And the final point is, even in the top-level polysomnography in lab, I had a top-level athlete that represented Australia in the lab. This is a number of years ago. He went to bed, he was all wired up, and you know with all the PSG, it's very difficult to sleep. Um, mm. But we're not really, we're looking for more diagnostic for sleep disorders and sleep habits, right? But midnight, he wakes up, brings the buzzer, I come in, he goes, oh, I haven't been sleeping. I was like, oh, you have been asleep, it's okay. No, 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 you just watching through the camera. I got my eyes closed. I'm like, well, we're actually looking at physiological measures. But anyway, I let that go. Yeah. 
you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm not sitting like looking at a TV going, oh, sleep awake, sleep awake, sleep yeah. awake. Like, you know, and that's what people often think. Um, so anyway, I said to him, look, um, I'll turn on the low, light the lamp. Here's a magazine. If you're still awake in an hour, ring the buzzer and I'll take off the electricity and go home. Because I was like, what's the point? Like, I'm not going to let him yeah. freak out. Anyway, 10 past eight, I'm like, knocking on the door. I said, it's time to get up. He's like, what? Oh, I just drifted off before you woke up. So anyway, he had a shower. I said, I want you to come into the, into the control room. I'm going to show you. And I went through all the traces of the PST. Mm. And I was like, look, you're asleep, asleep. That's actually asleep. That's asleep. Going through like all the 30-second the epochs on the top and the five minutes on the bottom, mm. scrolling through, showing him the video. Did not believe it, James. He was asleep for over eight yeah. hours. Like eight and a half hours, he goes, mm. no, I reckon I got two hours sleep. The worst I ever felt. Well, it's, like, it's what, so what do you do with that? It's so powerful. Well, I think, yeah, and our perception is so powerful, isn't it? And I'm, I know you, you'd be familiar with this research, but I'm sure the listeners might be interested if they're not, uh, about this idea of placebo sleep. And you know, there was a yeah. study, uh, there's a, several studies in this space, but uh, you know, this brings to mind, um, you know, a study was done back in 2014 around placebo sleep effects and cognitive functioning. Um, and uh, and how uh, when they do kind of false feedback studies, yeah. uh, you can actually profoundly influence to a significant degree people's cognitive functioning by um, giving them false feedback. Uh, and I think the tw- 2014 study was where they actually gave them false feedback about how much REM sleep they had and you know, trick people and basically say, I think they said, you need 25% of your time asleep in REM uh, if you're going to perform uh, well uh, in terms of cognitive functioning. And they um, actually tricked people into thinking that they were getting set up uh, with a PSG system, but actually it wasn't. They didn't track anything. They just gave yeah, them false yeah. feedback in the morning relative to yeah, the control. Yeah. And relative to themselves as a control, if you told people that they got more REM sleep than 25% um, or 25, they performed better. Um, if it was less, they performed worse uh, just because of their perception. And they've done similar studies where using false feedback um, on um, sleep duration as well, where they've uh, told people that they slept more or less than uh, kind of the amount of sleep that they told them that they needed to get to perform well. And that's probably one of my biggest concerns about looking at uh, sleep data uh, day to day. Um, as you described earlier, is that we obsess over a particular measure. And in all likelihood, it's probably only going to make us feel worse. And rather than looking at a trend over time, because as you said, we know that two-stage sleep classification with a wearable is not bad, like sleep duration, like you're awake or asleep. Um, But I think people increasingly are fixating every single day on not just sleep duration, but also um, the inaccurate, often sleep staging. And um, and I think it's causing some issues. So often I say to people when they're traveling in particular, you talk about jet lag and you work there. Um, if you're going on a trip, like don't either don't take your tracker or don't mm-hmm. look at it until you get back, because in all likelihood, it's only going to make you feel worse. Um, actually, yeah. just you know, check it out when you get home. But on the trip, wake up and feel whatever you feel. You know, tell yourself it's going to be a great day. Have a bit of caffeine and get on with it. And um, you'll probably be fine. But um, but unfortunately, this little bit of knowledge um, can actually be <laughs> quite dangerous and harmful um, if it's used yeah. in the wrong context. And I think you're right. Sometimes you just have a bad day. And, it's, and that's why I say to people, it's, it's okay to have a few bad nights sleep, you know, across a month, it's not a problem. And then people are like, oh, I'm an insomniac, I'm an insomniac. Like, you're not an insomniac because you had two nights bad sleep. To get diagnosed as mm. an insomniac takes three months. And, mm. you know, it's like seriously, like actigraphy and diaries and questionnaires. So stop saying you're an insomniac. I think the... And I don't know, this might cross over into some of the demand for what you're talking about psychology and some way for it. Uh, but do you think some people just like having a problem, James? Do people just thrive on having an excuse or a problem or a, a kind of a load mm. to carry or a burden? Do they like it? I don't think people necessarily I wouldn't just say that they like it. But I think that um, as human beings, we strive for certainty and we don't like uncertainty. And for most of human history, that's been very adaptive um, because um, if you're indecisive, when you know, a lion is about to attack you, then mm. you, that could be a very bad thing. It makes sense to kind of make a decision uh, uh, and come to a conclusion, even if it's false, because uh, in all likelihood, the probability is that um, you're going to survive more times than you die by doing something rather than just standing there and waiting for the lion yeah, to eat yeah. you. That's a very reductive view, but essentially that's my kind of philosophical position about maybe why we, um, we strive for certainty um, even in the face of incomplete information, and even if um, that certainty is incorrect. So we know that we don't like uncertainty, we like to strive towards certainty. And the thing about, um, uh, so the, the attractive thing about being able to put a label on yourself is that it um, lends a degree of certainty to an experience which can sometimes be quite difficult to describe, sometimes quite 
um, painful. Um, and so I think there's a tendency for us to want to apply labels. And I think some people perhaps have a greater tendency than others towards that desire to apply a label. Because suddenly, you know, you've got all this um, kind of very difficult to describe, um, quite painful experience. And you can just create this umbrella and say, well, this is what it is. And also, if you create a label, then perhaps it offers you a route to deal with it. And that's very attractive rather than just this kind of general sense of unease, mm. um, which maybe you don't feel that it's as easy to actually go and find the tools to, to help with that. So I totally get why people want to find a label and want to get a diagnosis. Um, but um, but I think that the the challenge is, you know, in the context of sleep, as we're talking about, that, you know, that I think there's perhaps a risk of um, medicalizing or pathologizing things that are actually just a normal part of the human experience. So, you know, particularly now, as you say, like with sleep, it's totally normal to get a bad night's bad night's sleep now and again. Um, and it's not going to kill you. It's just mm. part of life. And I think also there are periods of life where sleep can be disrupted for quite long periods. So, you know, I think um, Matthew Walker's book has done quite a lot of good in the world. Um, but at the same time, I know for a lot of people, it's actually generated quite a lot of fear. Yeah. Particularly, I found for people who are young parents yeah. or actually people who um, have maybe got a puppy for example mm. um uh, or you know for some reason they're being kept awake for a period of time and so you know like when i've done workshops and you know sleep has been a component in the things i've talked about i've often had people say well you know i read matthew walker's book and i'm worried i'm going to die now because yeah, my yeah. sleep is so disrupted yeah, yeah, yeah. because you know, my children are young uh they're not sleeping well or you know and this puppy thing has come up a lot i mean dog ownership has increased massively in the yeah. us and europe um over the last couple of years same and um, there's now there's now more dogs uh, kept as pets in the United States than there are children under the age of 18. Um, and so um, uh, it's, it's a massive statistic, isn't it? And mm. so I've talked with a lot of people. I work quite a lot in North America, in the US. And so increasingly, you know, it, it's people not saying, oh, you know, my kids are keeping me awake. It's somebody who's got a puppy that keeps them awake. Mm. But either way, they're concerned because they think they're going to die because they're not getting enough REM sleep because their wearable said that. And they know their sleep has been disrupted. You know, human beings are incredibly adaptable and resilient. And um, and I think, again, you know, there's this tendency we talk going back to your point about my work with this kind of middle group of, you know, the professional. You know, I, I'm sometimes a bit reluctant to kind of talk about socioeconomic groups and classes, but generally we are talking about people who are you know, quite affluent, relatively speaking. Um, and uh, often there's a high degree of conscientiousness and this drive towards perfectionism. Yeah. Uh, and actually this idea of perfecting your sleep particularly when people know about some of the adverse outcomes associated with inadequate sleep becomes a massive burden so somehow i think we've got to find this balance um where uh, you know actually you know i think it starts with being kinder to ourselves it starts with maybe recognizing that perfectionism and accepting that it isn't going to be perfect and um and telling ourselves it's going to be okay um uh, uh, there are seasons of life where sleep is disrupted do the best you can you're going to bounce back humans yeah. have done that for thousands of years uh, and the species continues to survive um but um rather than kind of fixating on the percentage of mm. REM time and kind of panicking that something's going to go wrong as a result I do, I do find like you raise an interesting point there about Matt Walker's book and I think while it's on the whole it's probably done a lot of benefit but um you know and I don't want to sound disparaging to Matt or any of his work because I'm, I'm not well I'm not but I don't want to sound like it is so I just want to say that caveat it's like people say I'm not a racist but you know but <laughs> I don't want to put my foot in it but I do think that what's happened is it's actually been Matt's succumbed to the fault of scientists because if you look at sleep research over the last 30 or 40 years it has been very much restriction reductionist um what happens if it's been very negatively focused the research really has only switched, as you know, to optimization and performance in probably the last 10 years and athletic stuff mm. and very little in shift work as well. So it has been very kind of medically focused about if we take away this portion of sleep or that portion of sleep. So Matt's book represents 95% of the research. So I think as a researcher, whilst we might get kind of annoyed at that book sometimes, um, we've got ourselves to blame as a research community. You know, I think we we need to be more proactive and predictive and more preventative and have a better message as opposed to being just selling doom and gloom. Um, and I know it's always hard because it's, it is a new subject, really. Sleep science has only been around since like the late 50s, early 60s. And um, it was very medically focused. And so it's it's no one's fault, but we do need to kind of flip it now and say, right. And I do think like there was some things in that book 
that had a little bit of poetic license in you know, about like sleep being an epidemic by the World Health Organization, which I never read that and I couldn't find that. And there's a few little things like that that could be just editor influence. But I do think on the overall, it's done very well. But we need to now start flipping our mindset, I think, as researchers, consultants, practitioners, and even as a general population about, okay, we know that. But are we going to be like in to get into those crazy states of sleep deprivation for the entire, our entire life? The answer is probably no or very little of us will. And it's because some sort of like crazy sleep disorder. So now we need to start working more towards optimization um, you know, and 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 to take a little bit of stoic philosophy, gems, I think it's about what's the modifiable factors within my control, like mm-hmm. what's inside my control. And that's what I like about your modules. It's about like, and I like the way you start off with behavior change and then work smarter, recovery, sleep, energy, and nutrition. You're building this and in this integration, these building blocks. Mm-hmm. And when I often talk to shift workers and they ask for advice, like, and if I'm working with them one-on-one, I'll be like, well, your BMI is like 32, you're obese. You're 45. You have a high prevalence of sleep apnea. We sent you for a level PSG, whatever test. It's come back. And to watch the excuses flow back. Oh, uh, yeah, well, you know, I like my food. I'm big boned. We're not big boned. Go and get a DEXA scan and we'll see if you're big boned. Because the, 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 like, you're not. So it's like people want to externalize as opposed to taking accountability and changing all these things as well. And I think that's where we need to just kind of nearly flip our thinking in 2023 for a lot of people coming out of pandemic and sort of the world getting back to normal we need to stop looking at being what's kind of afflicting us and then what can we do actually going forward that's me preaching a little bit there sorry about that but i just think there are some of the things that are that i'm seeing in the sleep world and what i'm trying to do going forward as well in terms of research that i do in my consultancy business the education that we do so we kind of have three manners consulting research and education and that's what i'm trying to promote it's more about optimization and performance and productivity and you know, being the best version of yourself as opposed to sitting back and going, we're all going to die because I've got 2% REM, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a good point. And, and I think, you know, that one of the, the thoughts that that brings to mind um, in terms of behavior change is, you know, avoiding this fixation on the tiny details while the big blocks are not in place and all the big stones. And, you mm. know, you talk about things like BMI and, uh, and our diet, for example, and, you know, you, there's no point obsessing about your kind of time in different sleep stages if you're kind of hammering the, the fast food every day. Yeah, yeah. And um, and also looking at what are the things, the kind of the anchors and uh, the behaviors that maybe if you start to shift those, the other things then really start to fall into place. And that's one of the things I talk about in that behavior change module. Um, you know, these kind of keystone habits uh, that if you start to maybe see change in these key areas, actually other things become easier. And, you know, I always think that I do really think that sleep is the foundation, but we know there's emerging evidence to show that actually exercise in certain types of exercise at certain times can have a positive influence on your circadian rhythm on sleep. Also, exercise is often associated with a bit of time outside. So you Mm -hmm. get some more contrast in terms of light exposure. So, you know, for a lot of people, I find that simply starting to try to move outside more in the day to integrate a bit more walking um, actually then starts to create. Uh, some some other benefits which just follow on from that and your sleep can be one of those so as you say it's looking at what we can control Uh, in terms of behavior change models there's one that i've found quite helpful and sometimes it's described as the behavior change wheel but really there's four components Uh, there's capability opportunity motivation and then the behavior and so if you look at your capability in terms of whether people actually have the tools or the resources uh, to be able to, to to do the thing that you 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 think they should do or they think they should do. Again, the opportunity, are there kind of systemic blockers um, that might be stopping them that you can remove? Motivation, what's really driving them? Why they're doing this? Because mm-hmm. again, you know, if we don't really look at the story behind the story, uh, you know, everyone knows that, like, well, yeah, we need to sleep more and yeah, we might die if we don't or put ourselves mm-hmm. in, uh, increased risk of all cause mortality, cardiovascular disease or whatever. Unfortunately, uh, the evidence seems quite clear that, um, we apply a very heavy discount rate on the benefits in the future. So you know, it's why people, no one saves enough in their pension, because for whatever reason, we don't care about 65 year old me very much. Yeah. We want a benefit today. And so looking at what that is, so it is more energy um, actually having more energy about uh, spending more quality time with your friends, the people you care about, you know, having the energy to do something after work uh, with those people that you care about or go and do a sport that you love you know, rather than just needing to collapse. And then saying, how do these behaviors support that and and look for that intrinsic motivation that will sustain people? 
And if you can put those three components together, the capability, the opportunity, the motivation, you can start to see some changes. Mm -hmm. and, and then you know, one of the things I often talk about is this idea of identifying a minimum viable action. Um, and so rather than saying, you know, I'm going to exercise five times a week uh, now and transform my whole life, actually say, well, you know, how many steps a day are you taking at the moment? Yeah. Well, a lot of people moving from home, uh, working from home now, often end up taking less than 3,000 steps a day. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe nudge that up to an average of 3,500 in the next week? You know, that's probably the smallest expression of started to integrate more physical activity in your day and do that. And it's amazing how these very small changes then start to build and even compound over time. But I think you make a very good point that really the key here is behavior change. And we can have all the data in the world. Uh, but if we're not using those data to actually inspire people and equip them to make positive changes that become sustainable, it's just interesting chat then, isn't it? It's yeah. very superficial. Um, and or, it's not really going to have the impact that we hope for. Or we keep yo-yoing up and down between different sort of things like you were saying. I think this is a classic time, like the start of 2023, we're going to see gyms yeah. getting packed, people out, you know, no matter where you live, and people are like, right, new year, new goals, blah, blah, blah. And in February, like it's all gone again. And I think it's I think it's uh, really interesting because there was a, um, you said about the steps. Um, so I'm interviewing Wayne Britton in um, January. Mm. He had that paper about the 8,200 steps. Did you see that in Nature Medicine? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I had about 300,000 people in the study and basically like, you know, the kind of threshold for good health was if you want to categorize our phenotype of good and bad. So anything over 8,200 steps a day was good. And so I often like will say to people the same thing as well. You know, there might be in a negative cycle with like poor sleep, overweight and maybe prevalence of a sleep disorder, have a sleep disorder like sleep apnea. And again, you know, whether you whether they believe it or not to have a sleep disorder doesn't matter. I'm just like, right, your goal is to like, you know, you want to reduce your body weight. But like you said, mm -hmm. you want to get outside and into green spaces or blue spaces. These are all good and have positive impact on our mental health. We know to get outside every day with natural light exposure, no matter what time of the day, better in the morning, but any time of the day, it's going to help like reduce depression, anxiety, and so on. I've seen that in some of Sean Cain's work at Monash. I was talking to Sean last week about it. But it's like you can go outside, get your 10,000 steps in the sun or walk around by the beach and get all these things at once. You can double and triple dip. And exactly. I said to people, if you're really busy and you want to go do that, go outside and listen to an audio book or a podcast or something you want to catch up on or a lecture that you missed at university. And it's so good now that you can do that with an iPhone. Or yeah. if you are on a call, maybe take your call outside and walk up and down the street or your driveway and get some extra steps and be outside in the sun. And it's amazing how many people yeah. go, oh, I never thought about doing that. I'm working from home and I just sit in the chair all day. But you can go around the back and hang laps or even in the winter, you know, I walk mm. up and down inside. Like I do that a lot on the phone inside. Just walk up and down and move around and stretch a bit. You don't have to be jumping around like, you know, like Rocky where you can be just moving around. So it's looking for those things where you can kind of double and triple dip across the day. Definitely. Um, I another friend as well who said he likes long distance running and he finds that listening to an audio book or a relaxing podcast is quite good because mm. it kind of keeps him in that kind of 120 beats per minute zone. He's not getting hyped up with the music. So he kind of just mm. gets into a groove and runs for two or three hours. So it's ways where you can kind of do one or two things together where you can get a benefit from it as well. And then it all kind of goes into a virtuous cycle where it's all helping. So you're losing weight, your sleep disorder is going away, your sleep disorder is going away so you're going to sleep better. You're sleeping better so your leptin and ghrelin are in check so you're not going to be gaining weight during the day. You're feeling better so you sleep better. You feel better, you know, it's just kind of a virtuous cycle. Yeah. I think sometimes, exactly. like what you said, is no matter where you make the change, it's, it's kind of a positive impact. So sitting around not making change is not any good, but so you've got to get out of that kind of state of inertia and get going and do something positive. Yeah. But then more importantly, have, you know, like you said, little small goals that you can achieve every day. So you can give yourself a little tick box in the green. And that's putting stickers on a chart for yourself. Do it like when you're five. Like mm -hmm. if you have to are ticking off boxes or coloring things. I know people love ticking off checklists. They're in your fifties. Tick, tick, tick. And write those things down. And if we write these things down, these plans, we're more, more likely to achieve them anyway. So there's, you know, research mm -hmm. around that as well about planning out stuff, even just simple writing them down. People end up doing exactly. them, you know? So it's, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. And you know, I think you know, the, the unifying principle, I think, behind this is this idea of focusing on the process, not the outcome. Yeah. And you know, focusing on what you're hoping to achieve um, is, is probably one of the biggest risks for behavior change, even though it sounds counterintuitive. So we all say, oh, yeah, I want to lose weight or I want to kind of uh, uh, be more active. Um, but actually, if we focus on how we want to do it, 
that's where the behavior change is often unlocked. Um, and yeah, there's an interesting study, which uh, you might have seen me post about a, a few days ago, where they did a review of 27 high quality articles, uh, narrowing down from this initial pool of nearly 18,000 articles and found that the positive effect of process goals, which is where people focus on specific actions that they can take. And you talk about the stoicism as well, uh, you mentioned earlier. So these actions were 100% controllable by the individual, that the effect of process goals was 15 times larger than outcome goals which focus on the mm. end point, uh, that thing you're trying to achieve that's out of your control. So, you know, if it was your fitness, um, it would be an outcome goal might say, I want to achieve a particular strength target in the gym, where the process goal would say, I want to work out at least five times a week, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, or if it was health, you might say, I want to improve my blood pressure uh, as an outcome. But the process might be, as you say, taking a walking break uh, between each meeting. And and so, you know, I think this is quite a good topic for the for the new year. And you know, I'd really encourage people if they're trying to change their behavior to focus on the process, the things that, that are in their control. Um, but also, as you said, I'd call it habit stacking. Look for whether there's those multiple wins. So I think you gave a great example, the walk outside, the bright light, improving uh, insulin sensitivity through that as well. So there's a really positive metabolic component. And then identifying the minimum viable action, the smallest expression of that. So you can start to build that momentum. And I think as well, you, great example of creating specific plans but then with regular sense of achievement. So you start to anticipate that reward. Uh, you get that endorphin, that dopamine release, which we know creates that, that virtuous cycle, mm -hmm. that positive reinforcement cycle. And, um, and, and you can do that quite simply and, and really achieve some, some fantastic outcomes in the end as a byproduct of just focusing on that process. And hopefully uh, to steal that quote again, uh, focus on being great at being consistent in those small yeah. things rather than have a heroic day that happens once every two years yeah yeah i love that and i like you i like your um your example around about the you know the linkedin and the social media stuff and i i don't know if you've been following this liver king saga have you yeah have you seen i it? mean uh, yeah. yeah it's interesting i mean your listeners it's uh you know, he's a he's a massive proponent of ancestral health isn't he and uh um uh he's uh following kind of a very strict ancestral lifestyle apparently um and it just so happened that uh, his kind of magnificent physique also <laughs> happens to have been supported by a fairly Still large right. amount of performance enhancing drug use yeah <laughs> and i think to be honest like it, you had to be it, it was pretty obvious wasn't it um uh, look come on he, 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 there's no way he didn't but, even pass the sniff test like if you thought that guy was think, natural like come on yeah I and mean, i think i mean this is again you know this is why Context is so important, isn't it? And yeah. I think you know, that was one of the things that you challenge not to fixate on, on Liver King. I think he's got his own his own challenges in life, obviously. But this is one of the most challenging things that I see in social media at the moment, that um, people are looking at what people post. Um, they trying to apply it directly to themselves without understanding mm -hmm. the context of that individual. And it's the same with this kind of, you know, this morning routine stuff that people kind of fixate over um, yeah, yeah. and obsess over. And it's almost like these, you know, these cults are emerging, really. And, and unfortunately, you know, the people who are in the middle of the normal distribution, who've got demanding jobs, lots of competing responsibilities and demands, you know, often are kind of thinking, like, I'm failing because I'm not able to start every day with four hours of focus work after I've had my double espresso and I've done my journaling and my meditation and, and all that. And like, if you can do that, good for you. But it's not realistic for many people. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, I think that was probably one of the most harmful things i think from that whole liver king debacle was you know, that he was suggesting that if you follow this ancestral lifestyle you could have this kind of hyper energetic life you know full of health with a great physique where you actually it was supported by performance enhancing drug use and to be honest if he'd come out at the beginning and said that and you know i'm i follow this lifestyle and by the way here's my kind of uh, um steroid cycle yeah. yeah i wouldn't judge the guy for it if he'd been honest about that you know i think um uh, you know, it, it, it'd be quite interesting, actually, to kind of you know hear about his approach to combining this with performance enhancing drug use. But, um, but I think, you know, actually, it's the it's the kind of the disingenuous nature of how he presented it that probably frustrates me most. That's deceived people, really. About but I, what's but I think I think what's happened here, James, is it's basically I think I think a lot of people are putting their anger in, into him because they know what's happening across the board for everybody. It's mm. from the Kardashians to Jordy Shore to the Liver King to to Joe Rogan, to Jocko, to whoever the character you want to pick. I think the problem is that people know that it's not real, but they want to feel like it's real. 
And then so when something like this happens, they're like, oh, I can't believe it, you know. At the end of the day, the Liver King said he's not an athlete. He's not punching punch anybody in the face. It's not like a boxer or something. He's doing any, mm. nobody any harm. But it's also as well, like if you listen to him, I've listened to a few of his episodes now talking about his apology. And it's really interesting because it's actually quite insincere, I think. And he's using men's mental health. And he's just trying to pull on any lever to get, you know, this sort of like hero type of character that he was doing it for the greater good. But even though he talks about his ancestral, ancestral tenants that he follows, he's mentioned now in two podcasts that, you know, he checks his phone just before he goes to bed. But he's like all about not exposing yourself to natural light. But he's mentioned now twice in other things like about checking his phone before he goes to bed. And he sort of leaked emails and before he's went to bed. So he jumped on the phone and blah, blah, blah. So even if he is following those tenants, like he's talking shit as well. So it's just what I'm trying to say to people is these people are living characters. They're They're, they're just like... The Pierce, real Brosnan, Pierce Brosnan playing James Bond or, you know, uh, what's his name? Like, um, oh, I don't, what, like uh, Tom Hardy playing like Bane. They're not real. They're just characters that they're playing. So people just need to kind of, I think, you know, take out a bit of a grain or a bucket of salt and go, like what you're saying, people are doing it for posts and clicks and businesses and the whole lot. They're not doing it because it's exactly what to do every day. So, you know, I think people yeah, just I think, need, yeah, need to wake up yeah. a little bit to it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I think it's a challenge, isn't it? Because as well, like, you know, we all love to pull someone down when they've been up high. And, uh, you know, big, uh, it's so, and it's one of these things where, you know, they, um, you know, the Liver King has obviously created a fantastic business, is flying yeah. around on private debts and whatever. And I think there's a lot of people who are just like loving the opportunity to like rip this guy down. Um, but I think, you know, for me, like one of the kind of the applications on it is, is, to be, um, is to be honest about the fact that like we're all flawed. And actually, yeah. I think that there's a um, uh, there's a challenge for us all. I think to um, you know, to be real about you know, what's actually in our own lives in terms of what we're struggling with, and and the, particularly we talked about social media at the beginning. Um, you know, there's this there's this temptation to um, uh, to present a kind of perfect a, a perfect representation to the world of who we are. And I don't necessarily think that social media is the right place to bear warts and all. Um, mm. uh, you know, personally, I'm, I'm, it's not something I'm particularly comfortable with. It's not necessarily the the, the channel that I'd use to do that. But in terms of um, you know, the people that we do have meaningful relationships with, you know, making sure that we are being honest about like how this stuff actually applies and uh, not creating a myth of perfection around us. But then also in terms of what we're doing on social media, even if we're not kind of posting pictures of ourselves like crying or, or whatever, uh, actually maybe being mindful if we've if we've got an increasingly visible platform um, uh, uh, to, to recognize that the, the kind of the, the ideas that we put out there in the world, it can have, uh, can influence people for good mm. and, and for bad and create a kind of expectation. And you know, to your point at the beginning uh, of our conversation, um, I, I'm really committed to trying to translate science into things that are useful and applicable in people's everyday life. But there is a responsibility that comes with that. There's a responsibility to try and represent that science um, in a way that's uh, that's accurate, but also uh, recognizing that it's not complete, um, that our understanding is still emerging, and and also not to try to um, uh, suggest that everyone's got to apply this stuff perfectly all the time. And if they don't, they're a failure. Because at the end of the day, whether it's Liver King or or it's me here in snowy Cambridge, we've all got our stuff, and mm. uh, we've all got our problems, and we're just often trying to muddle our way through as as best we can. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, James, I think this is a, a great place to kind of segue into um, if people want to uh, cut all, all the BS uh, <laughs> on social media and it's January 2023 and they're looking for a place to get going and they want to jump onto your um, Sustainable Performance Academy. Can you tell them just a little bit briefly about how they can do that? And also as well, do you have any coupon codes maybe or discounts you got to offer people for our Sleep for Performance listeners who may want to apply? Oh yeah, I can definitely put one of those together for you. Okay. So, I mean, if uh, if people would like to check it out, kind of get a kickstart to the new year and some ideas to improve their well-being and performance, um, the website is sustainableperformanceacademy.com. and um, you can get a preview of it and see some of the content there, the videos, and uh, that was filmed when I was in the French Alps. So there's some nice scenery there as well to look at, and um, yeah, I'll I'll sort out a coupon code for you so everyone can get a really good deal on that, um, and um, I'm sure in post production or whatever. Um, uh, Ian, you can uh, yep. can share that with your listeners. I'd be happy to create that for you. We'll put it in the show notes, and we'll put the link to that as well. And just so you know, this um, it's a it's a really nice little package here that James put together. And I think it's a good way to um to start off the new year because uh, it's got over forty um video lessons, seven weeks of inspirational and practical actions, mobile and tablet friendly content you can download. And I've just had a look at some of it there as well, um, over the last couple of weeks. And yeah, it's got 
you know, nice little short and sharp little things you can do. And I like the way you were saying you can kind of do it on your own terms. You can take a module a month or a module a week, or maybe you're sitting around and you've got a week off before you start back at work and you're doing a bit of thinking and planning. So you can maybe go through it over a, over a few days if you wish. Um, so definitely uh, check it out and have a look at it. But um, that aside, I think um, if you don't want to sign up for that, James does lots of great um, stuff on his blog, um, which we'll put the link in for there as well and over on LinkedIn as well. So please check out his content. It's really good. Um, James, it might be good to have you back on maybe when the PhD is all finished and maybe delve into some of those topics. Are you uh, hoping to publish yeah, that work? I'd, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's kind of five papers that that um, oh, uh, thesis is built around, yeah, yeah. and they're all, um, uh, they've got to be of publishable quality. Yeah. Um, I, I focused on just getting the thesis written rather than going through the whole kind of rigmarole of um, kind of uh, sending it yeah. off and getting it rejected and adjusting it and whatever. But um, but ideally, yeah, those papers, I'm going to be uh, submitting those uh, for publication. And obviously, once the PhD is done um, and the thesis is submitted, I'll be free to be able to discuss some of those findings in more detail and really would welcome the opportunity. Maybe we can geek out on some of that. And there's oh, some be great, yeah. very applicable stuff there as well, particularly looking at this idea of how we can get better at switching off, comparing the effects of alcohol relative to exercise <laughs> for psychological detachment and physiological recovery, for example. So yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that I'm sure we'd uh, we share we have a mutual interest in and we could discuss. Yeah, I think there'd be definitely heaps of overlap. So yeah, let's uh, let's reconvene in uh, 2023 and uh, later on this year and and have a bit of a chat. So this is January. This episode's coming out. So um, yeah, check out James's work and uh, we'll see you next month. Look forward to it. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, James. <laughs>